director. I'm Federica Bressan, and today my guest is Peter Dell, a music industry veteran, mixer, platinum record, recording engineer, Grammy-nominated mastering engineer. Welcome to Technoculture, Peter. I'm just thrilled to pieces to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me in your studio in Los Angeles today. It's a, a mastering studio. Let's talk about mastering to begin with because it's one of the steps of producing a record that not many people you know, know well when you say, hello, this is Peter, my friend. He's a mastering engineer. Hi, what yeah. is it that you it, do? It's, it's kind of a mystery to lots of people, sometimes including myself. But it's the final step of what I like to think of as four steps in the making of a, of, of a finished record. You have the initial step is the basic recording or tracking where you capture the performance from a small or large ensemble of, of musicians. And then the next step is the sweetening or overdubbing where you might do solos or put strings or horns or whatever. The third step is the mix where you smash all those disparate elements to a stereo for a stereo record, or maybe 5-1 for a, a video game or for a movie, or now we're entering the big scenario of lots of tracks with Atmos. Dolby Atmos is like 17 tracks. And uh, there's either smaller incarnations as well. And then the final step is mastering. Now, myself, all I do is stereo mastering for LPs, for records, and some for TV. Uh, like we did uh, the music for the TV show Empire, which has a lot of music in it. Uh, we were doing all the music for that show. But mostly the, the, the mastering is the final step where we make the mixes sound uniformly great. And the challenge there is sometimes you might have a lot of different styles, you also might have that the, the 10 or dozen tracks are done by three or four different engineers or producers, or it might even be the same guy, but maybe he's done it over a, a number of months or even years and in different studios. So we're not only trying to adjust for the stylistic uh, uniformity, but also trying to make up for whatever uh, anomalies there might have been in the rooms that these mixes were created in, where they thought they had the just the right balances, and then when you get them in here in more of a laboratory environment, you can see that sometimes what they thought was just the perfect thing was just a little less than perfect, or sometimes way less than perfect. Nowadays, you find uh, a lot of records, and really good records, are, are made in, uh, in less than professional studios, but more like maybe a home studio or a project studio. And it's not so uncommon to find that those types of uh, efforts need a little more professional love in order to sound, you know, finished and great. And historically, when did we start having mastering, you know, with what type of carrier or when the production process shaped itself the way it is now and also how it's changed? It says here you're a veteran, so <laughs> you can answer the question in historical terms. You've been in the industry for Way too a long. long time. When I, when I first started, I wasn't uh, a, a mastering engineer. I've only been doing that the last the last 17 years. Ouch. Uh, but for many years prior, I was a recording engineer. And uh, let's get back to the actual definition of the term master. And it came from back when vinyl was the one and only, really, uh, delivery medium. People were buying LPs. They weren't buying. There, were, there was no option to buy anything else. And so a master meant uh, a physical lacquer that you would then plate and then press hundreds or thousands, or if you're really lucky and you just had a big record on your hands, maybe tens of thousands or millions of copies. But they were from a physical master that you would make in the mastering studio. And you would uh, have certain things that you'd have to think about uh, when creating a physical master that we no longer have to think about when you're just making digital masters. Even CDs uh, had all but hardly any physical limitations you had to consider. The only thing really there was time. Uh, but the, the, the term master really came from when LPs, when vinyl was king, and that was it. And you really had to be concerned about a lot of different things uh, with LPs. 
Shall I tell you a couple more things about LPs that are interesting? About LPs and uh, what happens today? What's different? I was going to ask you about the equipment because a mastering studio is the perfect place to go to show that analog and digital coexist. This podcast is a lot about technology and normally right. digital technology, about learning about that, but in part about debunking the rhetoric uh, around the digital revolution and now it's all digital. In fact, there's a lot of analog here. There is. Uh, in fact, you'll see here that there are two computers, and one is like the playback source, and then I have a D to A converter, and then the, the audio gets processed by all this analog stuff that you see in front of us here, and then it gets recaptured on a second computer. And sometimes the, the need for that is because the source might come in at 192K or 96K or whatever, and if in the case of physical CD manufacturing, that we don't do too much of anymore, really, really. but that would be at 44.1. So you need a, to record at a different sample rate from that which the source came in on. But it's true that I think it's a fair statement that because mu so much material is now mixed in the box, either totally with a mouse inside a computer or on a big uh, digital work surface, Nowadays, they have large format digital consoles, which do the heavy lifting for uh, a, lot of, a lot of records and especially for TV and film. But for mastering LPs or for you know, ma mastering stereo music, a lot of it, the broad strokes, are done by the analog stuff. And uh, so therefore, I would say that most records, I find myself, it's a combination of analog and digital. I mean, obviously, the, the delivery medium is digital, either on a physical CD or a streaming service or digital wave files that are in the marketplace for the artist. But uh, on the way to the final digital so files, we go through a bunch of analog stuff because it adds color and character to sometimes stuff that it might be kind of lean and characterless by mi being mixed totally in the box. Some of the things that are incorporated into analog circuit designs are transformers or tubes, and they impart color that to your ear are uh, uh, are very pleasing. So a lot of our job is to make uh, the music sound as beautiful as we can. And sometimes, literally, just passing my, my source th through one or more of these pieces of gear is all it needs. It adds this sheen, adds a body to it, makes it sound marvelously more listenable and, and musical sounding than, than if it stayed totally in the digital domain. Some small and affordable devices, including a laptop computer, have made it possible for many people to avoid the recording studio, for example, so to work at home. Right. What do you think of home studios or bedroom studios and are they going to send you out of business, or they can't do without mastering? Yeah, I was going to say one of the, as far as mastering, they're going to definitely keep us in business for a long time, because as I intimated earlier, a lot of the stuff that we are able to offer as a service about being the final arbiter of the tonal balance and uh, imparting some of the. There's another thing about mastering is we impart the codes to the files. That means that you, the artist, or your publisher, or your record company, get are able to track the sales of your music and therefore get paid. I think very few people notice that you do metadata. Uh, it's an important thing. And in fact, that's another thing we could talk about perhaps a little bit. Uh, and, and that is, with digital, I mean, gone are the days, even with, with CDs, you got a booklet and you had you know, a listing of who did what. You know, what studios, what musicians, what, who the writers were. And when you just download a, an MP3 from, from iTunes, good luck. Even if you're just crazy about how it sounds, it takes a bit of detective work to go find out who did it. So we're now, when I say we, I, I'm part of the organization. You know, you've probably heard of NARIS, which is the Grammy organization, National Association of Recording Arts and Sciences. They're the people who give out the Grammys. And we're, we've been trying to... Um, come up with the best possible plan to embed uh, as metadata in the files all the credits from the moment you start the writing of the songs or the percentages of who gets what follows with the files all the way through 
to the mastering. You know, along the way, you'd have every recording studio who engineered what overdub, who played what. All that stuff would be accessible on layers if the, the, the customer wanted to delve into it. It would be there to be seen. That's great. Artificial intelligence. There are, Who are you calling artificial? <laughs> there are many applications, especially online, even available for free, that will do the mastering. You upload a track or multiple tracks, you know. Right. And don't what do you think of that? Is it working? Will it ever work? It's okay? It can't work? Well, at the moment, there are, are already, in fact, our company here, we have an automated mastering service that uh, doesn't have artificial intelligence yet. Uh, uh, it was designed by a guy who, who is part of our company, Shell Yakis, who's a multi-Grammy winning guy and has been around and really knows a good sounding product when he hears it. So it was his algorithm that we've incorporated. And uh, there, are, there are other companies, I, strangely enough I'm a little biased, I think that the, the one that Shelly came up with is the, arguably the best sounding one. But uh, what it's best for, what its long suit is right now, is like for anything that isn't like a frontline release. Let's say you, you're submitting demos to uh, get a record deal, or, or you're putting stuff... Uh, giving it to a, um, a music supervisor to put in a film or a commercial or a TV show or something, but you want it to, you know, really stand up and sound sound great. So um, these things are actually have their place already, and there are plenty of people who would swear by them. Others swear at them. And uh, as far as what the future holds, I think it's not that far away where they're going to really come of age and really be able to look at the music, look at other similar things, and and be able to correlate and relate and make make something beautiful out of what comes into it. Because right now it's it's uh, you know most of them are just they're just an algorithm. And I would also say that most of them are designed by people who are computer people as opposed to music people. But I do think that that day is not that far off. That they, that that artificial intelligence will make. At least mastering, because I'm dealing with two channels. Now, there are companies that are claiming they're going to be able to mix. Good luck with that when you're handed, you know, not 20, not 30, maybe 120, maybe a 220 different elements. Okay, now make me the perfect balance of all these separate things. I don't see it. I, don't, I can't imagine a day that that would ever happen. But I was wrong once. Well, there's a lot of art, expertise, human decisions, including taste, that go into this. So it's not to minimize the possibilities of artificial intelligence. Uh, <laughs> we will be surprised, but at least it's not that easy to automate. There right. is taste. There, there is experience. And and uh, you know what. Let's face it, especially with vocal, well, with any kind of music. I was about to say with just vocal music. But with music, there's an emotion. And, you know, one of our chores, one of our things that we're trusted with is to make sure that we get out of, you know, our final version, that we get all the emotion that was intended by the writer or the, that the performer put, tried to put into it. You know, you don't hide it. You try to reveal all that good stuff. And I think that the people who do the best job, you know, on this side of the glass as, as uh, you know, um, engineering uh, artisans, uh, craftspeople, bring a music level of musicality to it. It's not just, you know, plus 3 dB at 10K. It's, it's not just arithmetic, for God's sakes. It's music. It's emotion. It's art. So uh, just to follow up on what you were saying, that it really... It is, it's going to be a chore for artificial intelligence to get there. It's going to be a high, um, a high road to, to scale, but I won't be shocked if it happens. Well, thank you very much for having me in your studio today, for answering my questions. I my pleasure. I like to thank John Krivit of the Audio Engineering Society for putting me in touch with you. Yeah, John. Thank you very much.